we are reading today from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 4, entitled The Atrocities of King Kamsa, Text 30. We have read in the previous verses How Kamsa, with all of his power, influence, wealth, with all of his yogic perfections, his plans apparently were quite successful. Bhagavad Gita tells us that if we want to be peaceful in this world, we have to give up the desire to be the controller, the proprietor, and the enjoyer. <clears throat> Srimad Bhagavatam tells us that as long as we think in terms of aham mameti, that I am this body, those things in relation to the body are mine, then we become entangled in situations that inevitably lead to suffering. Nashato vidyate bhavo. Those who know the truth understand what is real is permanent. And whatever is temporary is unreal. The word maya means that which is not. In the Vaishna philosophy, what does it mean by unreal? It doesn't mean something doesn't exist. It means we don't understand what it actually is. The body exists. What is unreal is the misconception that I am this body. The soul, the eternal soul, mamayavam so jiva loke jiva buddha sanatana, is part and parcel of Krishna, eternal, full of knowledge full of bliss. <clears throat> when the eternal soul identifies itself with this temporary body, that is illusion. That is maya. So what is actually unreal is the misconception. They teach us a very powerful lesson that however successful we may be, we will fail if we don't build our success on a foundation of truth. So here is Kamsa. He did years of severe austerity to get such tremendous power. Each arm with the strength of 10,000 elephants. Even these great mystics that we read about later in Srimad Bhagavatam, Putana, Agasura, Bakasura, Aristasura, Keshi, Pralambasura, incredible powerful yogis these people were. <coughs> But in fact, they were all subordinate to Kamsa. Kamsa had defeated them all. And for most of them, he defeated them so severely that they either were to die at his hands or surrender to being his subjects and to do his will. 
So this is the power of Kamsa. He proved himself. And all of his plans appeared to be very fruitful. It was his desire to steal the throne from his own father, Ukrasena. Ukrasena was the commander of all the armies, Boja dynasty. <coughs> Kamsa conquered him, took control of all the armies, took control of not only the Boja dynasty, the Andaka dynasty, the Yadu dynasty, so many dynasties. Conquered all of them. Put his own father in prison. When he heard that voice that exclaimed the eighth child of his sister would kill him, he was quite successful in his efforts. Put them all in prison. Arivo Premdasji. We have three special guests today. We have Urmala Mataji Devi, and we have Yadubar Prabhu, and we have Professor David Haberman Premdasji. Let us very enthusiastically welcome them by chanting Hari. <laughs> Much louder, please. Thank you. <laughs> yes, he successfully killed six of the children. He successfully killed, kept his sister in prison. He successfully conquered all the other asuras. He successfully was conquering the entire world. So it appeared for many, many years that his atrocities were quite successful. But because he was building his so-called empire, and the foundation of greed, envy, and illusion. It was just a matter of time till everything would crumble. <coughs> we are speaking about Kamsa in today's verse. Well, sometimes we see in this world murderous dictators, terrorists, business people who try to earn by very immoral methods of greed and envy, sometimes even violence, how they are so successful and they have so much and simple knife, just like Kamsa, and simple, nice people like Devaki and Vasudeva are suffering so bad. Why is that? Maybe sinful activity isn't so bad after all. Maybe piety is just not so practical. We just do the needful in this world. But Srimad Bhagavatam is explaining every message that we could possibly need to know in such powerful ways. If we simply go deep into Srimad Bhagavatam, we could find the solutions to every level of life. Kamsa had everything, but he had no happiness. He had no peace. He had no love. He was fearful, arrogant, greedy, didn't know how to respect. He did respect Narada Muni. He wasn't 
real respect. It was more like business respect. He wanted something from that Mooney. So he gave him the respect as like a price. So here we find Kamsa <clears throat> had killed six of the children of Devaki mercilessly, right in front of her eyes. Kept them in prison, in chains. And the eighth child was born. That's really the only one he was really afraid of. The others were subsequent, and he murdered them. The eighth child, he couldn't sleep at night waiting for that child to be born. He had to kill him. He had the guards vigilantly watching and the moment the child was born, the order was, tell me, and I will massacre it. Krishna appeared by his own sweet will. He took the form of a little baby by his own mystical arrangements with the help of Yoga Maya. Vasudev brought that little baby across Yamuna to Gokul, Mahavan where he exchanged with the little girl, Yogamaya. And little Yogamaya Devi, little infant, tender infant baby. As soon as she came back into the cell, the doors locked, the chains clasped Vasudev again, and she cried. <laughs> And she cried loud, and she woke up the guards, and everybody woke up, and the guards immediately ran to Kamsa and gave him the message, and he didn't hesitate. He ran with all of his powers to that prison cell. He didn't want to waste a second. He didn't want to take any chance. Kamsa was absolutely thorough in his plot to kill this child. But however thorough we are, on the material plane, we are going to be defeated. He picked up that baby to dash her against the rock until she was like the filling in a samosa. <laughs> he was about to just smash her into a paste. But as soon as he lifted her up, she just slipped out of his hand. Just like all of our plans in this world, by the power of Maya, are going to <laughs> slip right out of our hands, even if our hands are as strong as Kamsa's. And she went into the sky and became Durga. Suddenly this little baby was a beautiful goddess riding on a lion, holding many weapons with her hands. Come, so you are a fool. <laughs> Nobody called Kamsa a fool. <laughs> the child that is meant to kill you is already born somewhere else. <laughs> For the first time in his life, Kamsa was defeated. And he didn't know what to do. But he became a little sober. The ahankar, the false ego, is like a fever. And in the fever of that ahankar, or false ego, we become delirious. We can't really see things clearly. Everything is completely whirling and swirling and hazy by that ahankar, that ego. 
And by the power of that storm of the ego, we believe what the ego wants us to believe. And we see through the lens of that ego. Srila Prabhupada explains, if you have yellow colored glasses, or in India we say spectacles, everything looks yellow. If we have red colored glasses, everything looks red. Now if we don't know where, if we don't realize that we're wearing spectacles, we think everything is red or everything is yellow. Premandina Churita Bhakti Vilochanena, Brahma Samhita tells, when our eyes are ornamented with the salve of prem or love, then we, we can see Krishna in his beautiful form of Shamsundar playing his flute. But the ego makes us believe, even makes us convinced of our own illusions. So here was Kamsa, never defeated, successful in every way. And now he's told that the child that is going to kill you is born somewhere else. And there was nothing Kamsa could do to that Durga Devi in the sky. So those yellow colored glasses of his ego were temporarily shattered. And then he started to see, what have I done? I killed my own nephews, six of them, consecutively. I broke the heart of my sister. And brother-in-law, I've committed such sinful deeds. And Kamsa was a profound philosopher. And a powerful yogi. And everything became clear to him. And here was this most cruel of all cruel people. He started to cry. He fell at the feet of Devaki and begged forgiveness. <clears throat> and then as we explained in the last few classes, along with his begging forgiveness, he spoke very accurate philosophy that was totally misplaced. <laughs> philosophy could liberate us, or it could justify the worst bondage. Srila Prabhupada explained, philosophy is useless if we don't have good character. Philosophy is meant to transform our character into a divine state. And it could be understood properly by those who are in a divine state. <clears throat> so Kamsa was speaking to them about the nature the soul is eternal. And ultimately everything is coming by the power of destiny, karma. And actually I wasn't the one that killed your children. It was destiny. I was just the instrument. It's true, but the fact is, he was 100% he was responsible, but he didn't want to take the blame. He wanted to put it on destiny. Whatever bad things I've done, it's actually your fault. This is the most irresponsible, wicked manipulation of the truth. 
But as we see in this world, when people manipulate the truth, it can become an incredibly powerful weapon of evil. That's what the ahankar, the false ego, does. The hatred, the violence, the terrorism, the judgmentalism, and all this stuff that comes along with religion. It's not about religion. It's simply about the false ego. And to give absolute authority to our false ego, we take scripture and we manipulate the words of the great acharyas. It's been happening for a long time. Back in Satya Yuga, Hiranyakashipu did it. He was also an incredible philosopher. Some of the philosophy he teaches, we quote the verses in our class because they're so accurate and so right on. But the problem is, He was teaching Vedic philosophy for the purpose of inspiring his people to help him kill Vishnu, who happened to kill his younger brother, Hiranyaksha. And Kamsa is speaking excellent philosophy to take the blame off himself to a large extent. But still, he was crying, and he was at the feet of Devaki. Now that's pretty humble for Kamsa, to be at the feet of his sister. And Devaki, Vasudev, they were so gracious and so kind, they forgave him. They said, yes, come, see, it's true, it was our destiny. They totally, from the core of their hearts, forgave him for everything. That was their greatness. And he recognized their greatness. He was actually in in a relatively enlightened state because the fever went down the balloon of his ego, that I'm the controller, I'm the enjoyer, and I'm the proprietor, (laughs) burst. So he released them with a repentant heart. And that's where we come to today's verse. Where after releasing him, he met with his associates. They were envious. They were the enemies of the devas. They were not expert in their dealings. And they gave advice to Kamsa. Now they were his subordinates. They're extremely dependent in, on their subordinates. They're willing to kill them in a second or destroy them one way or another, socially, emotionally, philosophically, or physically. But when they're in a weak condition, they really They're the only ones who really believe in me. So I need them. Yes, because he wants to be the controller. These people actually believe in me. They're on my side. And they're about to tell Kamsa, no. They were praising him. This is his vulnerability. 
He wanted to be the Lord, the master, and these people could control him because they, as long as they, perpetuated his illusion that he was the Lord and master. And he needed that. So why should you be afraid? You are Kamsa. Even the great demigods, the devas, fear you. You have already defeated all of them in battle. Indra, Vayu, Agni, Surya. When you fight them in battle, you break their limbs and either they die in their limbs or they run away. And as far as the three most prominent supreme of the devas, you have never them because Lord Vishnu is hiding in a solitary place in the hearts of the yogis. <laughs> and Shiva, he's retired and gone to the forest. And Brahma, he's totally absorbed in meditation and austerities, tapasya. Therefore, they're not around. They won't bother you. And all the other devas are subordinate to your power. If you lift an eyebrow, they will tremble in fear. So why should you be afraid? If this child is born somewhere else, then our advice to you, Kamsa, is we will go out on your behalf. Just give us the order and we will kill every child that has been born in the last 10 days everywhere. That was the end of his enlightened state. <laughs> It's very much in this history. It's symbolic. It's an analogy of what happens to us. <laughs> Many of us like Kamsa, little mini Kamsas, <laughs> we want to be the controller, we want to be the enjoyer, we want to be the uh, proprietor, also Janasya Mohoya Mahamma Meiti, we think in terms of I am this body and whatever is in relation to this body is mine. And in this way we exploit rather than serve. Divine nature is to serve. The demoniac nature is to exploit. <laughs> to not see how everything is the property of Krishna and everything should be used in harmony with the will of Krishna. But somehow or other, coming in association with devotees who are represented in this analogy by Vasudeva and Devaki, we become sober and we actually change our ways. It's the power of satsang. Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught us Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Sastra Khoi Lava Matra Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Siddhi Hoi That all the great scriptures broadcast that even a moment's association Lava Matra It's explained in the Shastras that a Lava Matra means one twelfth of a second. Even a moment's association with a sadhu, with a saintly person, can open the doors to liberation, to perfection. Mahatseva dwara mahurava moktes tamodwaram yoshita sangi sangam. By serving great souls, the doors to liberation are opened wide. 
but by hearing from and associating with people too much addicted to these egoistic material ways, then the doors to ignorance and darkness are opened. So this is so crucial. We are living in illusion. We associate with devotees. We become enlightened. And we don't keep that powerful association. And we allow ourselves to be influenced by that lower type of association that's trying to reconfirm our egoistic misconceptions. And we become swayed again into the path of darkness. Years before in this story, when Vasudev brought his first son, Kirtiman, to Kamsa, because he promised, in order to save Devaki, Vasudev said, there's no you want to kill your sister, but she's innocent. It's her children you're afraid of. I promise I'll bring you all her children, but let my wife live. Kamsa trusted Vasudev. That was the power of his devotion, that even such a demon, his life was at total risk but he trusted Vasudev that much. And sure enough, Vasudev brought the first baby. And Kamsa was, he was affected by Vasudev. What a saint. He actually kept his word at the cost of his own beloved child. I have nothing to worry from this child. It's the eighth one. Take him home. Be happy. But Vasudev knew that because of Kamsa's associates, because he couldn't control his mind and senses, anything could happen. And in that case, it wasn't demons that put him in that illusion. It was the greatest of all bhaktas, Narada Muni. Narada Muni came to the house of Vansda, to the palace of Kamsa. Kamsa knows Narada Muni. He's, everybody knows him. <laughs> He's been around a long time. So Kamsa wanted his blessings for his own nefarious purposes. So he actually honored Narada, gave him a nice city place, gave him gifts, bowed down and gave him nice words of praise. And Narada Muni, he has his own internal understanding of Krishna's desire. He knew that these six children that Devaki would be having were the sons of Maricha, who were actually cursed to take birth as demons. Not demons, but they were demons in the past. And this was to be their last birth. And they didn't want to be born and stay in this world. They wanted to return to their heavenly abode. So Narada, understanding their desire, they wanted to die as soon as they were born so they didn't have to live in this earthly planet. <laughs> the instrument of their wish and at the same time, he wanted to expediate Krishna's arrival in this world. Because Narada Muni is paradukaduki. He's compassionate to every living being. And the original Supreme Personality of Godhead was going to descend from Goloka, the spiritual world. It happens only once in a day of Brahma. Every eight billion years. 
eight billion six hundred and forty million years to be precise according to the Shastra. Krishna comes in his original transcendental form to perform his leelas. So this is a very special thing that Narada Muni, he, he wanted Krishna to come soon. So he told Kamsa, I was just traveling and I came upon a very interesting meeting that I think you'll be interested in. The demigods were meeting and the sages and the rishis. And they were all discussing, they were talking about you, Kamsa. <laughs> they were talking about you. <laughs> and it came to be that Vishnu was going to appear as the son of Vasudeva and Devaki. He's going to appear in the Yadu dynasty. And the demigods were also going to appear in the Yadu dynasty for the purpose of killing you. And another bit of information. In your last life, your name was Kalanami, and you were fighting against the Devas and Vishnu killed you. And he's going to come back to you. And your enemy, the demigods, are all going to be in birth in the Yadu dynasty to kill you. So I just wanted to give you this information. <laughs> Please be aware and take all precautions. And then Narada Muni Bajai Vina Radhika Ramana Name played his Vina chanting the names of Krishna. He went on to the next place. <laughs> so Kamsa put Devaki and Vasudev back in prison. That's the result of the highest association. <laughs> Sadhu Sangam. Satsang. I mean, what greater sadhu than Narada Muni? <laughs> so we have to understand very deeply what is happening. These scriptures, you see, the nature of the human mind is we like things to be black or white. Yes? But the problem is, there's not many things that are black or white. Krishna's kind of black and Radharani's kind of, and Balaram is kind of, is white. <laughs> Krishna and Balaram are black and white. That's <laughs> Other than that, in this world, there are, um, truth is something very deep. Truth is very profound. We oftentimes, we just have this tendency we want to bring truth down to the level that we, with our tiny little infinitesimal brains, can categorize it and say, I know. Hare Krishna. Achintya Shakti. Krishna is unknowable. Krishna can never be known by our categorizing philosophy. Krishna is only known by his grace. Philosophy we need urgently in order to do the right thing. Without philosophy, we don't know, you know, Vivek, the discrimination between what is favorable and what is unfavorable, what is real is unreal. But ultimately, some siddhir haritoshanam. When Krishna is pleased with us, Krishna reveals himself. Krishna tells in Gita, I can only be understood as I'm standing before you by unconditional, unalloyed bhakti or devotion. There's no other way. 
We cannot understand other aspects of the, of the absolute truth. But to understand Krishna is only possible by his grace. And his grace comes, sarvadharman parityasya, when sharanagati, when we actually surrender. And essentially, surrender means to surrender our false ego. To surrender our possessions, to surrender our abilities, could actually infatuate our false ego. Real surrender. Lord Chaitanya taught us, Trinada pi suni chena taror iba sehishnuna. Amani na manadena kirtaniya sadahari. To be humble like a blade of grass, tolerant like a tree, offering all respect to others and expecting none in return. That is the surrender that will please Krishna so much that when we chant his holy names, Krishna will manifest his form his pastimes, his abode, his qualities, his everything through the name. And then we cannot stop chanting. It's the higher taste that we're all seeking. That is by grace. The infinitesimal can only understand the infinite by the grace of the infinite. How is it that the infinitesimal jiva can understand the infinite of Krishna? Because Krishna is infinite with the chinti shakti, Krishna has the power to reveal himself to any one of us, any time. So by Narada Muni's influence, Kamsa put Devaki and Vasudev back in prison and started killing all their children and the children were happy <laughs> because they wanted to be. They didn't, want to, they didn't want to hang out in this material, earthly planet. <laughs> they were from a higher place. They were cursed to do this and Narada Muni was eliminating their curse. It was a beautiful thing. So sometimes the association of saints and the association of asuras, we have to really understand the Srimad Bhagavatam. But the message is the power of association. Srila Prabhupada explained what you associate with is what you become in your consciousness. If you put an iron rod in fire, it glows hot like fire. And you may say, it's still an iron rod, it's not fire. Then you touch it, my oh, intellectual, scientific professor, touch it. <laughs> still iron, touch it, sir. It burns like fire. It's fire. And yet it's still iron, too. If you put that same iron rod in ice, it becomes cold like ice. Touch it, professor. No, no. <laughs> what we, and it's a simple example you're laughing about. But it's not so funny when we become the iron rod. What we associate is what we become. The company we keep is so powerful. It affects the way we think. It affects what we value, what we prioritize. It affects the choices we make moment by moment. Mahatsevam dwaram ahurava maktes tamo dwaram yoshita sangi sangam. So it's so very crucial that we associate with saintly people. It's not 
a detail. It's foundational. Srila Rupa Goswami and Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, our professor David Haverman, Prem Dasji, he translated the entire Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu into English and describes all the various um, crucial principles of bhakti. And he explained the five most crucial. A chanting the holy names of the Lord, studying, reading, reciting Srimad Bhagavatam, worshiping the deities in Tulsi, visiting holy places like Vrindavan, Mathura, Dwarka, an association of saintly people. And without the association of saintly people, none of the others is sustainable. Because even if we associate with saintly people a little and start on the path of bhakti, we see Kamsa, he was a little enlightened by Devasudeva and Devaki, but as soon as he went back and started getting his ego pumped up again by his so-called subordinates, he became more vicious than ever before. They told Kamsa, just give us the order. We are on your side. We are your well-wishers. We are for you in every way. We have total faith and confidence in your prowess. Just give us the order. We will slaughter the cows. We will murder the Brahmins. We will devastate the holy places. We will persecute the devotees. And by doing, and we will, with your powers, we will conquer the devas. And then Vishnu will die. 